uh, I'm very happy with uh, Professor Kenneth Young uh, to give a course uh, this uh, semester. The origin of this course uh, was as follows. In 2002, uh, UNESCO in Paris uh, invited uh, a number of uh, physicists to give uh, general talks about the development of uh, physics. So I thought about it, and uh, in looking through the development of uh, physics uh, over the 20th century, uh, I thought it would be a good thing uh, to outline some general uh, themes, which eventually are called the melodies. Uh, and that, in fact, uh, has been my talk was about uh, one hour, and that has been published. Uh, I think you have a copy here. Uh, you have a copy either in uh, printed form or on the web. And uh, Professor Kenneth Young uh, and I discussed that maybe we should expand that, uh, because uh, uh, the three melodies actually cover most uh, of the most important developments of physics, in, of theoretical physics uh, in the 20th century. Uh, so that's the origin of this uh, course. So what I'll do is uh, let me first now read to you. I think you have uh, that. Uh, it has been said that the 20th century was the century of physics. There are the ample reasons to support the statement. It was in that century that man discovered for the first time since our ancestors discovered fire, the second and the vastly stronger source of energy, nuclear power. It was in that century that man learned to manipulate electrons to create the transistor and the modern computer, transforming thereby human productivity and human lives. It was in that century that man learned how to probe into the structures of atomic dimensions, discovering thereby the double helix, a key to the secrets of life. It was in that century that man ceased to be earthbound, taking first steps on the moon. In short, it was a century in which man made unprecedented progress on many fronts of human activities. And these progresses were largely ushered in by breathtaking advances in the science of physics. It is hard not to be impressed by the decisive roles that the climatic developments in 20th century physics had played in human history. But decisive as they are in human history, they do not represent, in fact, the true glory of the development of the science of physics in the 20th century. The true glory of physics in the 20th century lay instead in the deepened understanding of important primordial concepts which date from the beginning of human civilization. That of space, of time, of motion, of energy, and of force. In all of these primordial concepts, there have been profound revolutions in our understanding, revolutions that had brought forth a more beautiful, more subtle, more dis precise, and more unified description of nature. There have been in recent years studies of many aspects of the detailed history of 20th century of physics. It is not my purpose to delve into these subjects here. What I propose to do is instead to look into this history for the broad motifs of the developments and to trace the three main strands that had persistently woven through its conceptual develop advances appearing again and again in a variety of forms, singly or intertwined 
like the thematic melodies of symphonic music. We shall see that these three melodies together define the tone and the flavor of the main developments of physics in the 20th century. The three melodies are quantization, phase factor, and symmetry. What uh, Professor Kenneth Young and I plan to do is that uh, we'll expand on these themes and are mostly concentrate on the beginnings or the origin of uh, some of the fundamental developments and uh, many of these uh, developments will later on be taken over by Professor Young in more detailed uh, presentation. So that is uh, our general plan and this is uh, in some sense an experiment. Uh, such a course I don't think has ever been tried at uh, any universities. Uh, so I hope together uh, we'll have a enjoyable and profitable time. Uh, as Professor Yang said, uh, the way we divide uh, this course is that Professor Yang will talk about some of the grand ideas and uh, especially how these ideas came about historically and I will try to make things, uh, uh, bring things a bit down to earth, uh, make it more specific, more concrete and in terms of physics, uh, at least uh, make you learn, give you the opportunity to learn. I can't make you learn. I can give you the opportunity to learn uh, some actual formulas, make things computable, and relate to things that you have already learned in your course. And so it's the same uh, approach uh, in today's introduction. And today is really an introduction uh, to get things organized. So I will, uh, again, give a slightly more detailed uh, account of what we plan to do uh, in uh, this course. So, uh, again, an overview of the course is really to emphasize the relationship among uh, many different parts of physics and the three main ideas uh, Professor Yang has already mentioned, uh, quantization, uh, symmetry, and uh, local phase factor. Uh, and really, uh, uh, we can start from some basic ideas that you already know. And as uh, we require in this course, there are certain prerequisites. Uh, all of you have taken uh, the uh, required courses in your second year. And if we could start from there, uh, in your mechanics, you have learned about the principle of least action. Uh, that will actually be uh, uh, the source uh, where uh, we uh, consider phase and consider quantization. Uh, in your solid state physics class, you have learned about crystal symmetry, how a crystal has certain, uh, a certain symmetry group uh, that is uh, for, uh, a discrete symmetry group, uh, but in this course we'll be talking mostly about continuous symmetries. In e your course in electromagnetism, you have learned about the concept of the vector potential A uh, as a mathematical way of representing the magnetic field, and that will be a key concept uh, when we move uh, to local uh, gauge symmetry. And in your study of waves, uh, you have, of course, uh, learned about the phase factor, uh, cosine of, say, omega t minus kx, uh, and omega t minus kx is the phase, all right? Uh, uh, so these are ideas that you already know, and this course will be about how these ideas can be developed, uh, can be brought together. So, uh, and these will lead to the main ideas in this course. Uh, for example, putting together the concept of action and the phase factor leads to quantization by just putting the action uh, S as E to the I S as a phase, uh, that gives you quantization. That's something we will explain. From crystal symmetry, uh, we will talk about uh, Lie groups and symmetry. Uh, from the vector potential and the phase factor, uh, we will talk about local phase factor, which is one of the most important uh, ideas uh, in the 20th uh, century. And so uh, we have uh, these three main ideas again. And uh, from quantization and symmetries together, uh, we will talk a little bit about multiplets and selection rules, uh, which were developed in the context of atomic and nuclear physics and have become very important in particle physics. Uh, uh, idea of spin. And uh, bringing the three together, Professor Yang will also talk about uh, the laser and uh, BEC, Bose-Einstein condensation, which has become a very important topic, uh, experimental topic even, uh, over the last decade. Uh, and, of course, uh, a very important key concept that brings all three together uh, is non-abelian gauge theory, of course, also known as Yang-Mills uh, uh, theory. And 
on that uh, overview, I will now uh, briefly take you through what we plan to do uh, in the various lectures. Uh, first lecture by Professor Yang will talk about these things, uh, uh, mostly how ideas came about, Planck's paper, Bohr's paper, Einstein paper, Heisenberg and Born. Uh, the second uh, lecture, uh, also by Professor Yang, uh, will talk about the phase factor, Weil, Schrodinger, and Weil. Uh, and of course, bring in the square root of minus one. And some of the key ideas, of course, uh, is the following. Uh, that once you bring in i, uh, the phase becomes something like the exponential of i times the phase, uh, rather than the cosine. And Einstein tells us that the classical energy of a particle and its angular frequency omega are related by this formula, E is equal to h bar omega, whereas De Broglie uh, tells us that the momentum is related to the wave number as uh, P equals h bar k. And this leads to the simple idea that the energy can be represented as a time derivative and the momentum as a spatial representative. So you introduce operators. Uh, these are ideas that are familiar to you. And th this leads to operators and commutation relations, which are, of course, uh, key mathematical ideas uh, in quantum physics. Uh, starting with lecture three, uh, where I will take over uh, uh, for a while, I will uh, remind you of some of the things you have learned uh, with the least action principle, going back to classical physics, uh, to show you how Newton's laws of motion can be recast into a minimum principle to minimize the action S, to remind you of, of some of the key uh, properties of the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian and some applications, uh, in particular to electromagnetism. Uh, then in lecture four, uh, I will introduce the idea of path integrals, uh, which was actually invented by Feynman uh, in, I believe, the 1950s, early 1950s, or perhaps even the early, uh, late 1940s. Uh, and uh, the idea is simply the phase of a particle as it traverses a path is simply given by the exponential of I times the classical action divided by H bar. This is a key idea that links classical physics as expressed by the action S and quantum physics. But in quantum mechanics, we have to sum over all paths, and that is that sum is the word integral uh, in path integrals. And we shall see that we recover the classical limit uh, in the limit when h bar goes to zero. And this key idea relates phase uh, to quantization. And in lecture five, uh, I will uh, derive for you how this idea of the path integral can lead to the Schrodinger equation, uh, which you are familiar with. Now, most textbooks derive it the other way around, because uh, people know about Schrodinger's equations, and they use that to derive the path integral. But I will uh, uh, do it this way, which is actually simpler. Uh, then in lecture six, uh, Professor Yang will talk about symmetry, starting with crystal symmetry and leading to various uh, uh, Lie groups and continuous symmetries. And uh, the next few lectures uh, will then de develop this idea of symmetry more systematically uh, in the case of continuous groups, Lie groups. And uh, in lecture seven, I will start with the simplest uh, Lie group, uh, which in some sense you are already familiar with, translations and rotations. All right? And rotations in particular uh, leads to uh, the algebra of angular momentum, uh, in other words, SU2. Uh, this is, of course, the simplest group uh, that I think any physicist uh, would be familiar with, the special unitary group in two dimensions. And again, uh, this relates to phase, because translation by an amount C, uh, uh, if you translate the system by an amount C, uh, this is actually the, an operator uh, where it looks like a phase, uh, exponential of I C times the momentum operator divided by the H bar, whereas rotations... Uh, is a similar operator uh, which involves uh, the angular momentum, J. And with that, uh, in uh, lecture eight, uh, I'll talk about the rotation group uh, in some detail. Uh, some of it I think you already know, and talk about the representation of the rotation group. Uh, rep group representation theory is a very important mathematical concept. Uh, of course, we don't have time to talk about that in general, but through one example, uh, of SU2, uh, you will learn some of the basic ideas. Right? And uh, taking that rotation, which is in ordinary space, uh, mixing x, y, and z, as it were, uh, the generalization uh, is to mix things in some internal space, mixing some internal degrees of freedom, and the analogy between spin and isospin. So this is the SU2 of spin. Uh, namely, instead of exchanging spin up and spin down, 
you exchange a proton and a neutron, uh, which are called isospin up and isospin down. Okay, so exact formal analogy. And in addition to uh, exchanging two objects, uh, you can generalize this to exchanging three objects. Uh, for example, uh, quarks of three different colors, red, green, and blue. If you exchange the three and say it doesn't matter, you have SU3 symmetry, uh, and that is, of course, the basis of quantum chromodynamics, chromo meaning color. And also, there are actually two important groups in elementary particle physics, the color group, uh, which is exact, a symmetry, uh, uh, which is exact symmetry, and the flavor group, uh, which is uh, uh, an approximate symmetry. Right? And, uh, and also, we'll talk about phase symmetry in quantum mechanics and the group U1. U1 is the unitary group in one dimension. It simply says that you can change the phase of the wave function, and doesn't, that doesn't matter. Okay? And uh, Professor Yang uh, will uh, give lecture 10 on some developments that follow, uh, including spin, laser, uh, Bose-Einstein condensation, and non-abelian gauge theory. And uh, the next few lect lectures thereafter, I uh, will then try to develop the idea of gauge theory more systematically, because gauge theory is very key to the development of uh, uh, theoretical physics in the latter half of the 20th century, especially after the 1970s. It has uh, assumed a key role. And it is, of course, a non-trivial topic, so it will take a little bit of time uh, for you to learn the key ideas. And so uh, starting with lecture 11, uh, I will talk about the simplest case of gauge theory, uh, in other words, electromagnetism and U1. And this really uh, ties together two things that you actually already know, but you probably don't know that they are related in a deep way. One is that the vector potential A in, say, magnetism is to some extent arbitrary, right? You all know this. Second thing you know is that the phase of a quantum mechanical wave function is arbitrary. Now, these two ideas are deeply related, and in fact, it's one idea if you make the postulate that the phase of the wave function can be chosen arbitrarily at different points. I can choose a phase here, you can choose a different phase in the next room. In other words, you can make a phase rotation which is position dependent. Once you accept this idea, which seems so natural, uh, what you learn in electromagnetism and what you learn in quantum mechanics are brought together. And that is the key idea in gauge theory, uh, uh, which of course uh, uh, will be uh, generalized. Right? So the idea is, the, as the last bullet, is to, making, is to make the phase degree of freedom local. The phase at any point can be chosen independently. Right? So uh, the idea of gauge theory uh, relates deeply to phase and it unifies uh, key elements of electromagnetism and quantum mechanics. Then uh, in lecture 12, uh, I will talk about some ideas that later, in later generalization, both by physicists and by mathematicians have become quite deep, uh, namely the idea of parallel transport, uh, the mathematical construct of the connection one form, the idea of a covariant derivative, and how all these apply in EM and in non-abelian gauge theories. All right? uh, now, some of you I know have taken my course in, in relativity, and some of these words uh, may sound familiar to you, uh, but actually they, they uh, take a much simpler form uh, in quantum mechanics. Uh, so uh, non-abelian gauge, gauge theory again combines two main ideas. One is the idea of local phase, uh, but applied to lo internal symmetries. Right, so phase and symmetries brought together uh, gives you uh, non-abelian ga gauge theory. And the key idea here uh, is the concept of a private vector space for each point in space-time. Now, normally we think about, suppose you have a function, uh, a vector potential, A of x. That normally you think about as mapping x, which is in space-time, to a vector space, but only one vector space. But the key idea here uh, is that each point x in space, say this point x, has its own vector space. So a of x maps this x to this a, but this x maps to a different vector space. Right? So a of x and a of x prime live on different vector spaces. There is a private vector space for each point in space-time, and you have to try to relate this space to this space. And that is the idea of the connection one form. And that's a very deep idea in mathematics. 
and uh, the idea is how they connect to each other. And uh, in the lecture 13, I will continue with gauge theories. Uh, well, when you connect, you have to develop the idea of parallel transport, how you transport a vector here on this space to a vector here. Uh, and a key idea that then follows is that parallel transport do not commute. That is, if I parallel transport a vector from here to here to here, and you transport a vector from here to here to here, say along different sides of a rectangle or a square, the end result may not be the same. Okay? So parallel transport do not commute, and the failure to commute is called the curvature. Right? So that is the idea of curvature. It uh, has nothing to do with Riemann geometry, necessarily. Uh, it up appears even in EM. And in fact, uh, uh, we will show you that the curvature tensor is actually the field tensor. It's just the electric and magnetic field is the curvature, whereas the vector potential is the connection one form. Okay. Then in lecture 14, uh, I'll talk about whether the vector potential is physical. Now, you are accustomed to the idea that the vector potential cannot be measured. Uh, B is equal to curl A. B can be measured, has physical significance. A is just a mathematical convenience. But it turns out that certain aspects of A can be measured, and this is the Aharonov bohm uh, proposal, and it also relates uh, to a concept of magnetic monopoles uh, uh, and the mathematical construct of fiber bundles. Uh, that whether magnetic monopoles can exist, if so, under what conditions, uh, what are the quantization conditions, and that is possible only if you take a, a uh, more appropriate sense of which part of the vector potential is physical and which part is not. If you take the whole vector potential to be physical, uh, then you cannot have magnetic monopoles. Right? Uh, uh, I mean, th this you know uh, right away, because if the whole vector potential is physical, then B being curl A, then automatically divergence B is zero, right? Because the divergence of a curl is zero, and so there can be no magnetic monopoles. But it turns out there is a loophole around that, and the loophole is actually very deep, okay? Uh, just uh, to let you know some history, uh, uh, in actually one of the exercises, I will ask you, uh, possibly the, towards the last one, I will ask you to derive, in a very simple way, the quantization condition for magnetic monopoles. Uh, and that derivation, actually, uh, uh, Professor Lai Honming and myself wrote that simple paper, I don't know how many years ago, on an occasion when Professor Yang gave a series of lectures like this one. Uh, uh, and Professor Yang talked about uh, his theory and uh, talked about the collision, if you remember, between a, a point charge and a magnetic monopole, uh, which turns out to be much more subtle uh, than people realized. And Professor Lai and myself, we analyzed that and show that it can very simply uh, lead to the quantization for condition for the magnetic monopole. And it's a derivation that you even can do uh, now uh, without, without having learned any of these things. Okay? Mm -hmm. So may maybe uh, in this course you will also discover something new. So ultimately the uh, uh, bottom line is that the magnetic field B is actually too little. It doesn't tell you all information. Uh, Bom Aharonov tells us uh, that it is possible for a particle to travel in regions where B is exactly zero and still feel an effect. So B is not enough information. But the vector potential A is a little bit too much information because you believe uh, all of A is relevant, as I said, there can't be monopoles. And the right amount of information is a phase related to A. Uh, if I could uh, uh, simply write on the blackboard, uh, is actually something like a phase, uh, something like this, I guess, is, is uh, the loop integral of A, but placed on the exponential, so that uh, that integral does not even have to be unique. It only needs to be unique up to 2 pi. And, and it's that loophole uh, that it is the phase, namely this object raised to the exponential, that matters, uh, which allows monopoles. All right? Uh, uh, because you, if you see, if you don't raise it to a monopole, the closed loop integral of A by Stokes theorem is just the surface integral of B. So that would be the same as B. Right? But if you allow it to be uh, unique up to 2 pi, that gives you a loophole. And that loophole turns out to be very important. And you see, of course, again, the idea of phase, the idea of vector potential are brought together uh, in one place and leading to some deep concepts. 
And uh, magnetic monopoles are allowed uh, because uh, the vector potential A is defined on private vector spaces. Uh, in the sim if you, you can't have one single vector space on which A is defined. If you demand that, you can't have any monopoles. But if you allow different bits of A patched together, uh, you can't have magnetic monopoles. And that patching uh, is the connection one form. And this is the simplest non-trivial idea of what mathematicians call a fiber bundle. Right? And uh, I will tell you a little bit of the key ideas behind fiber bundles. Certainly not in a rigorous way. I'm not a mathematician. But the main ideas uh, can be seen uh, from this simple example. Then lecture 15, now only if we have time, because I'm not 100% sure that I, I can cover each topic in one lecture. If we do have time, uh, I will talk about Riemann geometry and general relativity, uh, and essentially bring these, map these ideas across to Riemann geometry. Uh, uh, because once you've learned these ideas, uh, Riemann geometry becomes, in a sense, much simpler. And a quick uh, review over manifolds, distances in the metric, uh, vectors on tangent planes, uh, and then the idea of one form and curvature, uh, just uh, so that you can connect the different ideas. And with that, uh, it will be very easy to state the law of physics in general relativity. Right? And the idea of why uh, I, I bring in general relativity is that once you have learned uh, the connection one form and the curvature in the context of gauge theories, uh, the corresponding ideas in Riemann geometry actually become quite simple. And in terms of that, uh, it's easy uh, to deal with uh, general relativity. Uh, and the relationship. Uh, between gauge theories and general relativity uh, is certainly a very deep one. And it's probably uh, one of the keys to the eventual unification of gauge theories, which now already uh, is an umbrella structure for the strong interaction for electromagnetism and the weak interaction. That bunch with gravity. Now, I don't think that story uh, has been finished yet. Uh, there are various proposals. Uh, uh, I don't think there is consensus. The story is not finished. But the relationship that they are all based on the gauge principle, the connection one forms and curvature, uh, I'm sure will figure in the eventual answer. And the story is by no means finished. Some of you may contribute to it uh, uh, as physicists. So uh, just to summarize, uh, it's these, these uh, main ideas uh, that uh, we shall talk about in this course. Uh, Professor Yang, you want to uh, supplement? Mm, no. Okay, so that is just the uh, overview. Now, if I may uh, spend a few minutes on the logistics of this course, and then perhaps we could answer some questions. Now, uh, first of all, you should all have one handout. All right? Uh, uh, if you don't, uh, uh, take it uh, when you go out. Secondly, uh, actually, everything on those handouts uh, are on this website. Okay, so this is in the departmental website. Uh, the website address is also on the handout, uh, so you can actually go uh, check there. Because this will be dynamic. In case we make mistakes, we will change it on the website. Okay, uh, the website will have now nothing is password. Pro most things are not password protected. Anybody can go in, except the discussion forum uh, is password protected. And uh, just to make things simple, everybody's username is Melody. Everybody's password is face, okay? Uh, just, just to make sure that uh, uh, you know, we, we keep this more or less within ourselves. Okay, so if you have questions and so on, uh, uh, or comments, post it on there. Uh, the TA, uh, you, you won't know. Right, that's TA. Uh, we'll, we'll try to answer most, most of them, okay? Then the teaching timetable. Now, uh, this is a two-unit course, namely uh, about 28 lectures. 28 one-hour lectures, uh, but Professor Yang, uh, after today, will be away for some time and won't be back until Oct mid or the 20th or so of October. And that's why the uh, schedule is rather compressed. We won't actually start the lecture one until, I think, October 25. Okay? And then, starting from then, we will be uh, doing uh, six lectures a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, 9.30 to 11. So uh, we apologize that we have to compress it towards the end of the uh, term. So that is a timetable. Uh, if you look uh, uh, on, on this website, uh, uh, the 
you should uh, be able to click onto the timetable. All right. So uh, and it's also also on on the printout uh, that you have. So uh, exactly which day who will be lecturing, what topic should be on there. Then uh, the exercise classes or tutorials. Now uh, on each Wednesday after the lectures, namely starting at eleven thirty, there will be an exercise class. Okay, but only on those days when there are lectures. Except that we will add two extra exercise classes. Uh, on the 11th and 18th of October, before the lectures, and the reason for that I, I will uh, tell you a bit later. Now, the homework or assignment, uh, because much of the homework uh, is really review and getting some groundwork ready, so that we don't spend too much time deriving, you know, details. Uh, you can and you should start doing some of it. Ahead of time, even before the first lecture, and so I have made some uh, assignments here uh, for the tutorial on October 11. Uh, please hand in problems one to nine. So you have plenty of time; you have a whole month. Uh, October 18th, uh, 10 to 14. October 25th, uh, 15, 17, 28 to 29. Uh, you want to? Could you put, put this on onto the notice board as well? Okay. So uh, the what you need to do, do those problems, uh, you should already know. It's, it's in the prerequisites, okay, just to get ready. Now, the homework policy, uh, now some of the homework problems are difficult. Not these, but some of the later ones are difficult. Uh, don't expect necessarily to be able to do it all, right? It's just a challenge, uh, uh, okay? And feel free to collaborate, right? Uh, but uh, not, not, you know, 30 people together, maybe, you know, groups of two or three. Uh, but state your collaboration, okay? If you collaborate, you say, you know, uh, uh, this is jointly done by A and B, and who, who did what percentage, all right? Don't, don't worry about marks, okay? And uh, uh, take notice of the university policy on academic honesty. I mean, you can collaborate, but state the collaboration, okay? So, uh, and try to do as much as possible beforehand. I mean, that's the dates when you have to hand it in, but if you can, you should do more, uh, uh, as much as possible, because towards the end of the course, uh, it will be a bit compressed. The grading will be 50% on the homework and 50% by a final exam. Uh, the date of the final exam uh, will be centrally scheduled. Uh, that really is all I have on the logistics. Uh, any questions on the logistics before we answer questions on physics? No questions. Then any questions on physics uh, to Professor Yang or to me? Are most of the students first year graduate students, second year graduate students? Well, okay, Let, let's take a poll. Uh, all first year graduate students, hands up. Okay. okay. Or second and higher year graduate students, hands up. Okay. Oh, any undergraduate students, hands up. Uh, I assume you are all final year undergraduate students, right? Uh, anybody not in the physics department? Uh, which department? Just just to know. Mathematics, Mathematics undergraduate. I'm actually from another school. What? Uh, Caltech. I'm just I'm just here today to listen. You are you are an undergraduate? Uh, no, graduate student. Graduate student, just uh, so you okay. Uh, any uh, person, anybody else from other institutions? Any auditors? Mm -hmm. ah. I haven't taken the physics course, but I Yeah, but uh, which department are you in? Physics. Okay. Uh, the rest of you are all actually enrolled? Uh, are anybody. Well, let, show of hands, those who have actually enrolled in this course, who will show up in the student list. Oh, so few. 
Okay. I see. Uh, huh? Okay. I, let me say a few words. Uh, I think that the, uh, this course is in some sense an experiment. And the, the traditional way of learning uh, everything in China is uh, to uh, choose a subject and uh, systematically uh, study that subject from the beginning to the end. Uh, that is the method of uh, studying which is adopted uh, all over Eastern Asia, in China, Japan, Korea. Uh, this uh, is not quite the fundamental spirit of uh, the education of philosophy, especially in America, uh, where uh, the system of study is much less systematic. It's uh, somehow uh, the students are exposed to many things at the same time. And uh, this is what this course is going to be. Uh, it's, uh, uh, this has advantages and disadvantages, uh, but I suppose most of you have uh, studied uh, physics a lot of the way, which is the more Chinese traditional way. So this may be uh, your first exposure to a more non-systematic way of learning. Uh, both are very important. Uh, it's, uh, so uh, I hope this experiment will prove fruitful to you and to Professor Yang and myself. Any other questions or even comments or suggestions? I, I, I actually have a comment to make. I'm, I'm new to Chinese University, but uh, for the sort of few attendance that I've got, you know, my feeling is you know, the training for some of the sort of you know, classes are actually more concentrate on the proficiency of you know how to use a formula, how to do mathematical formulas and so on. I mean, it's less actually on the thought you know, process. And uh, I feel, you know, for the study of physics, that might actually not be the best one. I mean, uh, too much emphasis on proficiency of handling the mathematics. Actually not the, the thinking of the process. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's just actually a comment from outside. Uh, you answer that. I. <laughs> Uh, yes and no. Uh, I mean, uh, I, to some extent, I agree with you. But on the other hand, uh, it is sometimes difficult to get a true grasp of the concepts without being quite proficient uh, in some of the formulas, uh, to the extent that you really don't have to think about the formulas. Uh, then you can think about the concepts. Uh, to some, like, for example, that formula I, I wrote down. Uh, if you, I mean, if Stokes' theorem and so on is not so automatic to you that you don't have to think, uh, uh, I th it would be difficult to grasp the concept. So I, I think it's a matter of balance. Yeah. My, my sort of view is actually not so much on understanding of the uh, mathematical formulas, but actually to drill, you know, the undergrad students or the graduate students to add applying, you know, this sort of formula to a lot of problems and even tricky ones and so on by and then losing sight on, you know, uh, the, the thinking process being the person. I mean, uh, it doesn't come. Uh, I'll make a r remark which is uh, somewhat related to what you are discussing. Uh, I have many, uh, have been asked by graduate students many times uh, how much mathematics as a physics graduate student I should learn. Uh, so let me tell you, for example, how I learned uh, group theory. Uh, I learned group theory because uh, when I was a senior student in Xinian Lianda in Kunming, uh, I had to write a senior thesis at that time for getting a bachelor's degree in Xinian Lianda. Uh, one had to write a 
thesis which does not have to be original, but uh, it must uh, show your understanding of some areas. So I went to uh, Professor Wu Dayou, uh, who gave me an article to study. It's called uh, Molecular uh, Physics and the Group Theory. So I learned that I have to learn some group theory. And my father was a mathematician, so he helped me by giving me a little book. Uh, it's, uh, I recommend that book to you if you uh, want to have a beginning of uh, group theory. Uh, there's one ch the book was written by Dixon, who was my father's uh, thesis advisor at uh, Chicago University. And uh, that book was called uh, uh, Modern Algebraic Theories. It's a little book. I'm pretty sure your library has it. And in it, there is a 20-page chapter called uh, Group Representations. That's how I learned uh, uh, group representation. So with uh, some elementary uh, concept of uh, the definition of uh, a group, uh, I had that uh, knowledge. And then the 20 uh, pages was uh, uh, introduced me to a beautiful subject, the representation of finite groups. But I didn't know uh, uh, Lie groups, continuous groups. As you have uh, undoubtedly already learned, that Lie groups is all over the place in theoretical physics today. But when I was, uh, when I went to Chicago as a graduate student, I didn't know anything about Lie groups. All I knew was uh, group representation theory of finite groups. So in Chicago, I found that uh, uh, there, was, uh, there was no use to learn, to go to a mathematics department uh, group theory uh, course, because that's uh, much too abstract, I wouldn't understand. But on the other hand, I found that uh, talking to Teller, who turned out eventually to be my thesis advisor, uh, he was using Lie groups or a, a rotational group theory, which is a continuous group, uh, very freely. Uh, so uh, through c contact with him, not through systematic uh, understanding, I eventually became very familiar with the three-dimensional rotation group. Uh, that indeed uh, was what every theory graduate student uh, in the 40s and 50s must learn because uh, all those uh, symmetries and new quantum numbers and selection rules uh, were related to, uh, at first, to representations of uh, the three-dimensional rotation group. But then naturally, because uh, more quantum numbers were found, so people went to more complicated groups, uh, like uh, SU3. So in the 50s, uh, theoretical physicists began to learn uh, SU3. Uh, one of the uh, great uh, theoretical physicists of the 20th century, uh, Murray Gell-Mann, uh, who was in fact uh, Professor Young's uh, thesis advisor, uh, had to invent the SU3 uh, group structure by himself. Uh, that is how many people uh, gradually, through intuition, uh, expand their knowledge of uh, group theory. Uh, that's also how I, I did not take the same route as uh, Murray Gehrman, but uh, I also learned uh, uh, continuous groups theory, not by a systematic taking a systematic course, but uh, through gradual uh, learning pieces of it, uh, either by myself uh, or through necessity, talking to other people 
or looking at uh, some uh, chapters of uh, books. Uh, if a person takes a course, that is uh, a fast way of uh, learning something, but there's a dis disadvantage. The disadvantage is that uh, what you learn through a course may not match with what you need in physics uh, immediately. And uh, uh, the advantage of learning it through the uh, necessity of using it is that what you learned is the, uh, is the spirit which uh, is the necessary part of how to apply it. While if you learn it in a course, you may not know how to use it. Uh, that is uh, my experience. So, uh, the, the, what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, uh, you are probably accustomed to learning uh, new things through taking courses. But it is important also to know that uh, another way of learning uh, is in fact maybe more important, uh, namely through contact with uh, real problems and then gradually expand your knowledge, uh, especially in mathematics. Mm -hmm. let, let me expand on that uh, because some of the topics uh, we'll discuss is exactly the rotation group. And uh, I'll be introducing some of the key concepts exactly through examples. Uh, without stating very general mathematical theorems, uh, which I don't know anyway. Uh, so, I mean, ideas like uh, what is a group, what are the Lie generators, what are representations, what are irreducible representations, what are Klebsch-Gordon coefficients, uh, each through just about one non-trivial example, uh, the minimally non-trivial example, uh, to, so that you get the idea. But I don't think you can get the idea without yourself having carried out at least a computation for one non-trivial example uh, to get the idea. And, and I think that is the minimum amount uh, of, that you have to do yourself to do the calculation. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that, that is how every field develops. If you look at the, how mathematicians uh, today understand the group representations, uh, you will realize that uh, uh, it was not the whole thing which was uh, altogether developed uh, all at once. That is the way you are given to understanding a course. But that's not how uh, any of these subjects develop. Uh, it's uh, through some intuitive ideas of pushing in various directions, you get uh, into a complicated frontier. And then somebody comes along and uh, look at that after he understood all of them, he writes a textbook which integrates uh, all of them. But uh, that is uh, very rarely the way in which the whole subject was developed uh, from the beginning. In fact, in this course, uh, you will see that all these developments, uh, symmetry, uh, phase factor, and uh, quantization, had uh, at the beginning very complicated uh, histories. Uh, it's uh, what you learn in a course, in a usual course, is likely to be a kind of a, a smoothed over end product. Uh, what uh, Professor Young and I will try to uh, tell you uh, is that, that that don't be fooled by that. There are many complicated things which uh, historically uh, sometimes take very funny paths but eventually, we arrive at a general uh, unification of uh, many of these ideas. Any other questions, comments? Uh, we, we have uh, the PowerPoints uh, all uploaded and I think uh, you may do well to look at them ahead of time before you come to the lectures. Mm. Yeah. So 
perhaps we could, if you have no, no other questions, we could end early today. Uh, I apologize. I won't be here on October 25th when Professor Yang gives his first lecture. I, I will be out of town. But, uh, I, I, will, I will watch the video afterwards. Yeah. Okay, and if you have questions on anything, ask uh, uh, Yuan Long. Uh, his, uh, he can be found uh, there. Okay? Right. Thank you.